Hi, I'm James with TVS Pro, and this is part two of our Mavic Air series. This is full instruction, and this is going to be more on app navigation, all the ins and outs on that Go4 app. Uh, we'll also be talking about some of the new flight modes like Asteroid. and Boomerang, as well as some of the new shooting modes for stills, some really cool panorama shots that they've added into there as well. So, and if you miss the getting started and opening box, you can refer to that video as well. And I should note on the intelligent flight modes, we're really only going to talk about Asteroid and Boomerang. If you're interested in any of those other flight modes, we've got a Spark intelligent flight modes, that covers four of the available quick shot modes. And we also have a part one intelligent flight modes, things like course lock and home lock. And part two intelligent flight modes, that was when they introduced the Mavic, Phantom 4 Pro, and Inspire 2. Things like active track and terrain follow and such. Again, for this one, it's just going to be on Asteroid and Boomerang. So without further ado, let's dive into the app. Okay, we're gonna turn this guy on and we're going to flip this, and don't forget to remove the cover when you first power this on. Push, push and hold. We're all connected up, and sometimes when you turn this on, it will say that there's an inconsistent firmware found, and that may mean that your radio is on a different firmware than your copter. And you can update those directly through the app. In fact, right now it is checking for the latest version, and it is, so no windows popped up and I don't need to do any firmwares. But that's all that is telling you, to make sure these are uh, on sync with each other as far as firmwares. If, you, if it is on the bottom left-hand side telling you that you are connected, but you are not actually seeing any camera when you click on Start Flight, then it's probably because this is on a different firmware than this. Make sure they are all on the same firmware, restart it all, and it should work just fine. We see that all the time. So as far as this homepage goes, on the bottom left I've got equipment, that's this homepage. I've got editor, play with this. If you're familiar with doing any of the editing that you can do on like iMovie with your phone, or some of the basic editing that uh, social media apps have, like Instagram and Snapchat and stuff like that. It's really what this is, but for the videos that you've created from here. So it will wirelessly transmit those videos, either recorded on the micro SD card or the internal eight gig storage, and put them here available so you can add music, transitions, clip here, clip there, and throw it out onto social media from there. Skypixel, this is basically DJI's version of Facebook. It's a community of flyers that are using DJI products. You can follow people, you can like people's stuff, and it's just a collaboration in a community specifically targeted for aerial flyers. And on the bottom right is me. You will want to make sure that you are logged in. We have seen problems with firmware inconsistencies if you are not. And this will also show you some of the levels that you're at and how much experience you've got, as well as who your followers are and stuff like that, if you are into that. Up on the top right portion of the screen, you've got three lines. If I touch that, it opens up an option for Academy, and this is where you'll see some of DJI made tutorials, as well as manuals and whatever else, right there available on your uh, app. You've also got flight records. This is a fun one. This is going to show you all of your previous flights, give you thumbnails, and uh, see what your experience level is. And truthfully, I don't even know what any of these levels mean. It just kind of is fun to see you go from level one to level whatever you're at, and how much growth value and how much distance. This is saying 300, 329,000 feet over 354 flights overall through like Phantom 1s to Inspire 2s and everything in between. What is cool is on the right hand side is your actual flight log or list. And it will show you on the right, you'll see those thumbnails, and it actually shows you some thumbnails of some of the shots that you took. This was taken just yesterday. I went out and did some cool stuff with uh, Asteroid and Boomerang, and we'll go over some of those features here in just a minute. It will blow your mind. It's a lot of fun, and these quick thumbnails just give you reference to what that flight was, as well as give you a total distance, the time that you were flying, max altitude, things like that. Most people don't understand that I can click that file, and it's actually going to load up a map and show us where our flight was and actually show us the path. So this kind of lighter lines 
uh, you can actually see where I was doing boomerang mode and the flights just before that when I was flying through those pillars and stuff like that. And on the bottom, if I hit play, it's actually going to show us my flight path and up on the top, show us all of the telemetry of my flight, my total distance, my altitude, my speed, all of that real time. And I can scrub through this too. So I can scrub through here and so you can see these are my routes going through those pillars, go through and then I come out and I can watch it do, so this is where I'm setting up a uh, boomerang mode and in a minute it'll go around in that circle and show me boomerang and if I want on that bottom side I've also got a radio controller. If I touch that it pulls up the flight sticks, the joysticks on your radio and it'll actually show you real time what you were doing when it was flying. So right now it's just hovering and I'm not really doing anything in this moment. And as I, uh, there you saw a little bit, so there it goes into boomerang mode. See, so there I'm in boomerang mode. You can see that arrow and the red arrow represents the copter itself. There's some green fans that you're seeing at the tip of that arrow. And what that green stands for is the camera. Now with the Phantom series, the Mavic series, Spark and whatever else, the green and the red are always going to line up. But if you are accessing this flight record with an Inspire 2, and you have, well, even if you didn't have a second operator, you can have yourself and you can pan separate the camera from the copter. In that moment, the green is going to face in the direction. So you know in this flight mode which way your camera was facing when you were flying it. So that's flight records. The other two available options is GeoZones and Find My Drone. These are pretty self-explanatory. GeoZones will help you access a database to let you know if you are in a restricted area or other restricted airspaces and such. The other one is Find My Drone. And again, this will help you track it down. If you end up taking it around a tree and, you, and it got stuck in the tree and you're just trying to find it, this will help you track that down. So that's the menu up on the top right. Get into the main camera view. If you're familiar with any of the other DJI systems, this is going to look almost identical. The two arcs that you see in the middle of the screen, those represent the optical avoidance systems on the front and the back. The top arc being the front, the bottom arc being the rear sensors. And you won't see that bottom arc unless you're flying a Phantom 4 Pro and Pro Plus series. They're just measuring proximity, okay? And if your volume is up on the device that it is that you're using, iPhone or Android, iPad, whatever it is, if the volume is turned up, you will hear a series of beeps. And as you get close, it will beep more repetitiously, just like the backup camera in your car. So we're gonna work our way from the top left all the way to the top and around through the bottom and we're gonna go as quick as we can for you. So on the top left, if I touch DJI, it takes me back to the home screen. The next one to the right is my status bar. That color will generally match the same color that is on the back. Right now, this is flashing green and that's just because I can fly it but this status bar is saying yellow. And that's simply because I only have five satellites. For this status bar to go green, I need at least six satellites. But I'm indoors, I'm not gonna have GPS. So it says I'm ready to go, just like the green light says on the back, but in yellow and with vision. That means it's using the VPS sensors on the bottom. The two ultrasonic sensors and the two optical cameras. And I can still fly, I just don't have GPS, okay? If I touch that status bar, it opens up the overall status of the aircraft. Basically a snapshot of all of my systems, whether it needs a firmware, whether it's healthy, needs a calibration or whatever else. On the top overall status, that's just gonna tell you if you need a firmware. If I touch it, it will open up a window and I will have itemized lists if something needs to be firmware updated and I can go back to the home screen or plug into the USB port on the back into a computer download the Assistant 2 software from DJI's website and run firmwares and calibrations that way. Next on the list is flight mode. That is just telling us whether we are in position optimization. That's what opti means. And that just means all sensors are working or sometimes it'll talk to you and say addy mode. I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time on it, but addy mode is basically there is no GPS lock or vision positioning lock. Basically, if you're hovering and a gust of wind comes up, it will drift. This happens sometimes in indoor flying and that's probably the number one reason why people crash it into walls and stuff like that when they're flying indoors. And it's just because they have gotten used to it not 
moving around. It's so stable and it does a lot of that locking position wise horizontally on its own that when they get it indoors and it's not doing that, they're unprepared and they don't really know how to respond or take care of it. That's what Addy mode is. If I put it into sport mode, then it would change that flight mode as well. Just know that if I put it into sport mode, none of the other intelligent flight modes are available. It needs all of these sensors working in order to do those flight modes like active track and such, and it turns those off when you're in sport mode. And another note on sport mode, because all those sensors are turned off and you're going potentially very fast, 40 plus miles an hour, that gimbal is gonna get the shake. So just be aware, it could ruin your shot with a little bit of jello. Next up is set max flight altitude. This will always default to 120 meters, which is 400 feet. I don't recommend changing that. You are free to do what you will, but that is the FAA standard is to not go higher than 400 feet. Next up is compass calibration. Most people don't do compass calibrations. I have started to do them less frequent because of these more modern systems don't require it so much. But my rule of thumb has been twofold for a long time, since the Phantom 1 all the way through to the Inspire 2 and even the Mavic. Twofold, if you are changing your departing location. And I'm not talking about if I depart, if I take off from here, but then I cross the street or even a mile away, do I need to do a compass calibration before I fly? No, but maybe if I go from the valley into the mountains or across states, yes, I would do that. Number two is changing the time of day. If I fly at 6 a.m., well, this time of year, it's going to be about five degrees. If I fly it in the afternoon, I could be like 30 or 40 degrees. That difference in temperature will affect the barometer or density altitude that it thinks it's at. So if I'm flying at different times of day and there is a great difference in air temperature, then yes, I would do a compass calibration. An easy way to check whether you do or don't, and I know I'm skipping ahead, but if I click on the copter symbol up in the top middle, that takes me to main controller settings, and if I scroll all the way down, go to advanced settings, and touch sensors in the middle of the screen, that will show me my two accelerometers, my two gyros, and up at the top I've got a tab. If I touch compass, there it shows me my compass. If you're flying a Mavic Pro or a Phantom or an Inspire, then you would see two compasses, not just two accelerometers and two gyros. Next is IMU. I briefly just mentioned that, and that just tells you the health of, those excel of the accelerometers and the gyros. You can do a calibration, and all you'll do is follow the step-by-step -step instructions. It will tell you to tilt it one way, tilt it the other way, don't bump it, don't touch it, other than when it tells you to, and it's basically just reteaching it what is flat and level. Next up is ESCs. These are electronic speed controllers. These are what communicate to the motors when you send it signals or when it's trying to fight wind and those gyros and accelerometers aren't flat and level, then it's going to send increased RPMs to the motor so that it can stabilize. And it's doing these calculations super, super fast. It's rare for ESCs to go out, at least in these modern systems, but it can happen and this will tell you its health. An easy way to tell if an ESC is working or not, simply take off the props. I'm gonna do that now. Now that I've got the props off, I'm gonna turn them on by going down and inward on my joysticks. Take off. By all intents and purposes, it thinks it's flying. So if I start to move it, it thinks it's just wind pushing it around. So if I move it, the motor should vary in RPMs because it's trying to stabilize itself. This is actually a good thing. All it's doing is testing the RPMs and making sure that it can level itself upright. Vision sensors, those are the ones on the front and on the back and also the ones on the bottom. This is just going to tell us, is it functioning properly or do we need a calibration? Again, to do that, you're gonna to need to plug into the USB port, hiding behind this cap, plug it in, turn on the Assistant 2 software and run the calibration on those sensors. Remote controller mode. This is telling us if we are in mode two, mode one, mode three. If you are flying in the United States, don't touch it, leave it at mode two. Case closed. Remote controller battery, we say more. Button customization. I have got a function button and a C button that I can customize. The function is located near the right joystick and the C button, which is located on the top right hand, close to the shutter button. Right now I've got it set to advanced camera settings and battery info. So if I get out of here and I push the function button, there's my advanced.
camera settings. If I push the C button, there comes up my battery info. They give you, in that drop down, a few different options for you to choose from. Playback mode, which is just like pushing the play mode on the, top, on the right side of the screen. Navigation, battery info, take your pick. From there, if I scroll down, I've got aircraft battery and aircraft battery temperature. I will say one thing about the battery temperature. Optimal battery temperature is from 5 to 45 degrees Celsius. Um, really, so right smack dab in the middle is going to be 20. Around the winter time, we see a lot of DJI systems crash, and that is because they get too cold. If you are flying in really cold weather or in really hot weather, and it just falls out of the sky and you think it's broken, I hate to tell you, but that's actually pilot error. You should have been watching your battery temperature. When I am flying in really cold weather, I will take off and hover, and I'll let it hover for a minute or two to let that battery warm up, especially a system outside of the Inspire 2 because the Inspire 2 has self-heating batteries. The Mavic Air, Mavic Pro, Phantom, they do not. So be aware of that temperature. And then next is gimbal status. Is it normal? Is there obstructions and things like that? Nope, in this case it's normal. Uh, I don't have an SD card in there, but if I had, I would have a format button as well as a format button there for my internal storage. Since we're on subject, if I want to cycle between those two, on the right hand side, I've got the lines with the circles. That is your camera advanced settings. As I go into there, if I touch the gear mode, down at the bottom, I say storage location. Right now it's set to SD card. I can go to internal, internal storage. Right now I've got about eight gigs uh, of internal storage. If you are recording internally and you fill it up, a notice will actually pop up and say internal storage full, would you like to switch to a micro SD card? Sure. That is the status bar up at the top. Now we're gonna move quickly around the perimeter and we're not going to cover everything but we're going to cover what I feel is essential for you to know. So on the top middle with the drone symbol, again it's telling us we're in opti mode and this opens up our main controller settings. Home point settings. There is an arrow and a person symbol. The arrow represents standard home point settings that we've been used to for a long time. As Soon as I turn this on, when it hits seven satellites, it locks its home point. And if the volume is up on your device, it'll tell you home point has been initiated. If I want dynamic home point, meaning I don't want it to come home to where it took off from, I want it to actually come to where the radio is, that is called dynamic home point. And if I want that, then I would select the person it will default back to standard home point every time I turn it off and turn it back on. So if you want that every time, dynamic home point, then you're going to have to select the person every time you turn it back on. Multiple flight modes, easy. If I toggle this on and off, it will enable or disable those flight modes. If I get out of that menu, on the left hand side, I've got a symbol of a radio. That is where I'm going to access my intelligent flight modes. If that radio button is not toggled on for multiple flight modes, it will not let you access those modes. Return to home altitude. It defaults 30 meters or roughly 100 feet for return to home settings. What it'll do is when it does it, if you allow it to, climb up to that roughly 100 foot altitude, fly itself over where its home point is and bring it down slowly. You can change those depending on your area. So if you have walked the area and you see a lot of high trees, uh, you may want to change the, that return home altitude. Beginner mode, not going to spend a whole lot of time, toggle it on or off, it limits you to 100 feet up and 100 feet out. Easy. And there's a duplicate option there again to set max flight altitude. Advanced settings. The only thing I want to cover in here is we've already mentioned the sensors. That is for your inertia measurement unit. Everybody asks what is IMU? That is your inertia measurement unit. Accelerometers, gyros, and compasses all work together to stabilize your copter. If these things are out of parameters, it's not going to fly right. It takes two seconds. Take those two seconds to go into this, check the sensors, and make sure before every flight that it is airworthy, that these sensors are working, that they're within the parameters of safe flight. I'm gonna move down on the list 
from where main controller settings was and go to the next one down, which is visual navigation settings. These are things that will help you avoid obstacles and things like that. Enable obstacle avoidance. And a lot of this is self-explanatory. They've made it simple and they've got descriptions there. You can toggle all of these on and off. Do you want it to enable backward flying? Yes. Do you want it to avoid obstacles while active track? Sure. Do you want to display the radar chart? Sure. You can toggle all these on and off. And if I go into advanced settings, I have some additional ones. Do I actually want the sensors on the bottom to operate? Landing protection, I will mention that. As it is coming down, it's going to notice whether or not it's a rocky terrain or a water terrain, and if there is enough battery life, it will give you the option before it touches down to say, I don't like this area. Are you sure you don't want to land someplace else? Well, sure, let's land it over here, and it'll let you land. You can turn that on and off if you want to. And return home obstacle check. This is just going to make sure, it's going to face the direction that it is flying. When it goes into a return to home, do you want it to check for objects? Sure, not a bad idea. These will always default as on every time you turn on the system. That's why it's in the advanced settings. They're highly recommended. Next down is remote control settings. This is going to allow you to do some calibrations on these sticks if they are not calibrated correctly, meaning it doesn't read zero when it's straight up and down and you're not touching it. The copter does have to be off in order to calibrate it. And then you can adjust those programmable buttons as we mentioned, and you can link remote control. Let's say you drop this into a river and it's now dead. You buy a new remote controller, it now has to be paired. You do this by turning on the copter and the radio, hit link remote control, it'll give you 60 seconds for you to push the linking button located on the Mavic Air. And the button for linking on the Mavic Air is actually similar to the Spark in that you will use the battery power button. Hold it down for 10 seconds and it will start hunting for the signal sent from the radio. Next option down is Wi-Fi settings. Truthfully, I would leave this in auto and just let it do its thing. Next is aircraft battery. This is a three cell battery, and this is going to tell us the voltage somewhere between 3.8 and just over four volts. Basically the health of the battery. The low battery warning that you're seeing is the white dot on that green timeline represents that low battery warning. If I go back into there, I can change it from 30% to whatever I want. I don't change it, I leave it at 30, and generally bring it home shortly after that first level of battery warning, roughly when my battery life is 15 to 20%. Next up is gimbal settings. This is pretty simple. The gimbal mode has two modes in this Mavic Air, either FPV or follow. Follow is what it defaults. If you pan this way and tilt this way, it's going to stabilize so that your footage and your horizon stays nice and flat. If I want to, I can go to FPV mode. FPV mode is like Superman mode. If I wanted to get that racing type of look or Superman going down through a canyon, it will lock the roll motor and allow you to do that. Next up is general settings. There's only a few here that I'm going to cover. Most important is your measurement unit. Do you want Imperial or metric? Simple. Next up is select live broadcast platform. If I want to, I can actually broadcast live my aerial footage on like Facebook Live or Weibo or YouTube, but you're gonna have to have either a strong Wi-Fi or most likely a strong cellular connection in order to do that. But if you want to, you can broadcast it to your cousins in New Zealand. So that is the row up on the top portion. Just beneath that is that timeline. You're gonna see kind of in the middle, just right now anyways, just beneath that satellite symbol, that is my flight time. Right now it's showing hyphens because I'm not flying, but when I'm in the air, it will show me an actual time. Eight minutes, nine minutes, 10 minutes, and so on. And as I fly, that is going to slowly decrease down onto that timeline until I hit my first level of battery warning, which it defaults to 30%. And the next on that timeline is H. H is kind of like the point of no return. Basically, it can't fly itself home on its own. When you hit that H, a notice will pop up, I'm going to go home if you don't do anything in five seconds. For the most part, I say cancel. I like to be the one to bring it home. But if you want, let it go home. If you choose to fly it beyond that, then it's not going to have the battery life to make it home. That's why I say point of no return. The next white dot is the second level of battery warning, which will always be 10% 
at least in this platform. You can change that in some of the others. If you choose to fly it beyond that second level, eventually it's just gonna have to come down. I recommend bringing it home and landing it somewhere between that 30% dot and the H, the go home part. Bring it in between there and you should be okay. Just beneath the timeline, I've got all of the information of my camera. I've got my ISO, it's doing that automatically right now. My shutter speed, my exposure value, my white balance, and generally for the most part, it's not a professional camera. It's only capable of so much. Leave it in auto. It's better to leave the camera doing its own thing so that you can focus on flying. If you have the time and you don't have a lot of trees, power lines, and whatever else, then sure, take the time to line up the shot. But generally speaking, I just leave it in auto because it's not like it's a crazy professional camera to begin with. Next to that is going to tell me my capacity. Right now it's telling me that I am shooting at 2.7K at 30 frames a second, but with a red slash through my SD card because I don't have one inserted. If I had, next to that it will tell me my capacity. Right now it's showing 00 again because I don't have a micro SD card. And then next to that is my internal storage. Again, I've set it to record at 2.7K at 30 frames. And next to the capacity is just telling me that I can record internally on the eight gigs of storage at that same resolution, 2.7K at 30 frames a second. Moving down on the right side now, I have got a symbol that toggles photos or stills and video. This will change some of the options as I toggle back and forth. I'm a video guy, most of the time I'm just doing that. And hey, it's in 4K, so most of the time I can make do with just taking a still grab anyways. I don't take a lot of photos, but it is capable, and if you want to access some of those other settings, toggle between the two. Beneath that is my record button. I never, sh I never use it because I'm always just using the record button on this side. If I toggle to the photograph mode, it changes that button to a shutter button rather than a record button. Easy. Just beneath that, we have the advanced camera settings. Again, this is gonna be pretty self-explanatory. For the most part, you can leave it in auto, but if I want, I can put it in manual, and now I can adjust my shutter speed, my ISO, and it will give me an exposure value down at the bottom. Again, if I don't wanna worry about that, throw it into auto. It's much easier when you're flying. If I'm in photo mode, at the top, I've got multiple options. High dynamic range, multiple frames a second, auto exposure bracketing, timed, and panorama. I really wanna spend some more time on panorama, and we'll go outside to do that. Panoramic shooting mode for still photography. Before you can initiate this, you need to make sure that you are in still, not video mode. You do that by cycling it, that button just above the shutter slash record button. So I cycled it to photo, and now I can go to options, and go to the top where it says photo, and go down to the bottom where it says panoramic. I have sphere, 180, vertical, and horizontal. For this one, since it's the coolest and newest, we're gonna do Sphere. Once I select Sphere, I can get out of that menu, and all I have to do in Sphere is simply touch the shutter button, and it'll start calculating and sampling all of these photographs. At the end of its rotation, just like in asteroid mode, it's going to stitch all of these photos together. And just like in asteroid mode, on the right side, just beneath that shutter record button, it is going to give you a percentage. Right now it's showing 40%. So we're almost halfway through taking a sphere panoramic shot. It just calculated to stitch those together. And now it's processing 80, 100%, done. At the end of it, it'll give you notice that says panorama, successful. HDR mode is going to take a couple different photos at different exposures, put them together so that you've got a wide dynamic range of lights and darks. Auto exposure bracketing will do kind of the same thing, but you can choose do I want to take multiple frames, three or maybe even five frames. So it's very similar to high dynamic range. I kind of skipped over the multiple, but that is basically going to take, I've got an option of three frames a second, five frames, or seven frames per second. Time shot, pretty simple. I can set a timer, hit the shutter button, and it will take the photograph after that specified time. Next is image size. I have an option between 16 by nine or four by three. Next up is image format. If I want, 
This generally shoots a JPEG, but I also can choose RAW if I've got access to a photo editor like Lightroom or something like that. And if I want, I can also select JPEG and RAW and it will save both stills as proxies. White balance, self-explanatory, change the white balance. Again, I recommend just leaving it at auto because you're always gonna be moving around. White balance is always changing and it's hard to stay focused on that when you're flying. Style, seriously, you might wanna just stay away from this. It's all about picture profiles. I'm moving on. And next is color. When I'm in still mode, I have no other option in color. It's always gonna be normal. But again, if I toggle to my video, these options change. Now I'm gonna start from the bottom and go up. So color, the Mavic Air is a little bit lighter of a craft, so they don't make all these other looks available. They do make Cine-like. Best example of what Cine-like is, is it's kinda like shooting in log. It's not quite as flat as log, uh, I would have been surprised that they had made it available in this, but if you want, you can shoot something similar to it. Video format. I can shoot in MP4 or .mov. It's really just a codec and a wrapper. They're both shooting at H.264. It's just whether you prefer .movs or MP4s, kind of like Mac versus PC. And then the next one is video size or resolution and frame rates. As I go into here, I can shoot at 4K Ultra HD, which is a 16 by 9 ratio. When I touch that 4K, it gives me the options to shoot in multiple frame rates, 24, 25, and 30. I actually, because it's aerial and you're usually moving pretty decent, I like the look of the 30 frames, but if you're trying to be standard, shoot in 24 frames. As I go down in resolution, I can up my frames per second because it requires less processing with a smaller resolution. So as I go to 2.7K, it now opens up 60 frames. That's great. I actually enjoy shooting 2.7K at 60 frames. After all, it is only a third inch sensor and 2.7K softens it just a bit. Sometimes I feel like the 4K being produced on this sensor is crazy sharp, almost too sharp. Like it's a POV type of camera. I enjoy 2.7K at 30 frames and 60 frames, and I have had a lot of fun with shooting with in 1920 by 1080 at 120 frames a second. For this little drone to shoot 120 frames a second, it is a lot of fun. Play with this. It's really gonna allow you to slow things down and get some great cinematic shots. And if I want, of course, I can go down to 720p, but at 720, I have no increased frame rate. My max frame rate is 120 frames. So unless you really had to shoot in 720 for maybe storage capacity, now that I've covered the photo and the video settings, we're gonna move over just a bit over to the settings bar. I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time. A lot of it is self-explanatory. You can turn on histograms, you can turn on smart LEDs. Basically, if I hit record, do you want those LEDs, the red ones up in front, to turn off, stuff like that. Overexposure warnings, grids, and all kinds of different things. But as I scroll down, this is where I can change my storage location. If I want it, I can default to internal storage or default to SD. What's kind of cool is that if I fill up my SD or my internal storage, it will bounce over to that alternate storage without dropping a frame. Now that camera settings is out of the way, just beneath that is the play button. I don't have anything on the internal storage or on the micro SD. I just dumped all that footage from yesterday, but if I hadn't, I could access this from the air. This is all similar from the previous systems. However, up at the top, they've added a toggle. So I can select which storage it is that I'm accessing, whether the micro SD or the internal storage. So if you shot stuff on the internal storage and you see this page, just pay attention, toggle that down to internal storage. On the bottom right hand side, we've got a map. This will always be there unless you are shooting with a phone. It's not there, but there is another little icon that I can still access that map if I want to. If I touch it, it will actually swap the map with the camera view. And if I want to go back, I simply can touch that camera view again on the bottom right and it swaps them back. If I don't want the map and I want it to look like how it is on a phone, then I touch the top left square symbol that is there and make that disappear. And I can bring that map back by touching that same symbol on the bottom right hand side. Bottom portion of the screen is what I feel is actually the most important and what you will spend the most time staring at. On the bottom left, you've got a circle. 
basically this is an artificial horizon. The blue is representing the ground, the black is representing the sky. As I pitch and roll and yaw and tilt my camera, my blue horizon changes accordingly. And it will also tell me from north which direction my copter is facing. This can be helpful in the efforts of trying to find a lost drone. Next to that circle, it will tell me my distance, my height, my horizontal speed, my vertical speed. Yes, if you're unfamiliar with DJI systems, it will give you a vertical speed indicator and an up and a down arrow telling you how fast you are moving up and down vertically. And on the right next to that is my vision positioning system. It will duplicate similar to what the height is telling me. But instead of using a barometer, it's using the sensors on the bottom. Over to the left side now. I'm gonna start from the top and down. That arrow with the circle represents auto takeoff. I'm going to initiate it now just for fun. I don't have any props on, but what I would do is touch it and slide to take off. It'll start up the props and hover up to about four feet. In this example, it's going to notice I don't have any props and it's going to turn off automatically. It's that smart. I want to make one note. After I do an auto takeoff, that up arrow will change to a down arrow and I can auto land. Keep in mind, that auto land is different from the next symbol down beneath that, which is go home. Auto land is wherever it is, it'll come straight down and land. Auto home is initiating it to actually horizontally travel to its home point and land there. Next symbol down is the radio symbol. And as we briefly mentioned, it is intelligent flight modes. This gives me access to all the available modes. But for this one, all we're gonna talk about is asteroid and boomerang. Asteroid mode. First things first, I've gotta get it off the ground. With asteroid mode, it's going to go backwards and fly upwards close to about 150 feet. So make sure that whenever you're doing this, there is a good clear distance behind where that Mavic Air is going to go. Otherwise it'll run into something. Well, theoretically it shouldn't, right? Because of the rear sensors, but just take the safety precaution. When I do this, I make sure that I have my thumb on that pause button at any moment during any flight mode of any kind, I can push that pause button and it will stop whatever it is that it's doing and you regain manual control. So I'm gonna fly it over this way here. I've got a good clearing here behind me. We'll scoot back just a little bit and come over this way and it's gonna go up this way. I'm going to touch the radio control symbol on the left hand side and select quick shot and from there at the bottom of the screen it's going to give me all of my quick shot options one of them being asteroid so as I touch asteroid it says aircraft too low so I'm going to increase that altitude there it went away I'm going to tilt my camera down and there'll be a green dot it automatically finds an object that it believes that it needs to track from here since it's already found me all I have to do is touch where I am on the screen and it'll go into tri or asteroid mode. Countdown, three, two, one, and it begins the process. I'm now going to keep my thumb on that pause button. Here we are at 57, 72, 92. It's ascending pretty darn quick. 120, 135, 140. And now it's actually going to start capturing panoramic video by rotating the, yawing the copter, tilting the camera up and down, and then yawing again. Tilting again, yawing again, tilting again, yawing again. And it's basically getting a 360 degree view of the entire scenario or scenery. Once it's done getting all the video that it needs, it will ascend back down and approach us. As a tip, on the right hand side, just beneath the record button, you will have a percentage. That percentage represents how far along this asteroid process it has. So right now it's at 96% because it's on its way down and 100%. And it stops. 
and that is almost, it's a couple feet away from where it first started, but that's pretty darn accurate. For boomerang mode, if you're already chosen the quick shot mode, just beneath that, there is that asteroid or whatever other quick shot symbol. You can touch that and it'll bring up at the bottom that whole list of quick shot modes. For this one, we're gonna do boomerang. So I'm going to select boomerang and it says choose direction. Do I want it to go clockwise or counterclockwise? For this one, we're gonna have it go counterclockwise. So now that I've selected, I touch where I am on the screen or my center point and it'll begin boomerang mode. Make sure that when you do this, it has a good distance or clear distance behind it because you can see it actually goes pretty far back. That's our first level of battery warning, but we're okay. Slows down at the apex, comes back around this way. This is your sound of music. I'll put my thumb on the pause button to make sure we don't hit Jake, the camera guy. But guess what? It landed, wow, almost exactly where it was where we took off. That's boomerang mode. The next symbol down is a whole new system from DJI to help you avoid objects in a forward motion. It's called APAS, or Advanced Pilot Assistance System. Basically, as the symbol shows, an object, as you're flying forward, it will automatically calculate free space and try to go around. Before with obstacle avoidance, if you tried to go forward and it found an object, it would just stop and hover. Sometimes that ruins your shot. If you misalign something and you were going towards it, it will find the free space and actually continue in that forward motion. Ultimate test here, we've got Jake the camera guy to test our APAS, Advanced Pilot Assistant System. It advertises that when it's enabled by pushing the symbol on the bottom left hand side, it will allow me to push forward on the right joystick to pitch forward and if it senses an object, it will go around it. So here we go, I'm going to pitch forward. I won't go too fast, Jake. It automatically went around, it just went around. Look at that, wow. I'm just pushing forward. That's going up. And it went to the right a little bit. Look at that. It's gonna hit it. No, it didn't. Look at that. Is it gonna hit the ground? Oh, and it climbed up for the ground. Woo! <laughs> that's cool. So that's it. That is the Mavic Air full instruction. I'm sorry that I'm not able to cover everything. There is a lot here, but hopefully you've got the necessaries to be able to go out and fully utilize what this thing is capable of. Like I said, it feels like a lot of plastic. It's really light, but what it can actually do is pretty darn impressive, and it's a lot of fun. Hopefully the dealer or source from whom you've purchased it will be able to offer some added assistance if you've got some in-depth questions, but if you do have some simple questions and you like our video or you don't like our video because I talk too much, feel free to leave those comments down below. You're also welcome to send me an email at jamesb at tvspec.com. I'm James with TVS Pro. Click on that subscribe button somewhere on this screen and I'll put links in the description as well, some videos here, some maybe somewhere over here, and that it answers most of your questions and helps you guys get out there and start flying. Good luck and happy flying.